more like, at some point we had to move on. You spent cal uh, pre-calc and all the time before that, college algebra, I'll, I'll, I'll include college algebra, pre-calc, calc one, calc two, and up until this point in calc three, talking about single variable functions, right? Their derivatives, their antiderivatives, and all that. And now we're gonna, we're gonna expand it to functions of multiple variables, uh, several variables, multivariable calculus, all right? So you'll see that questions involving domain limits and derivatives and antiderivatives are now no longer gonna be just in terms of functions of x, they're gonna be in terms of uh, functions of x and y, maybe x, y, z, maybe x, y, z, and then something after that, all right? So all the possibilities are open. The issue is the more variables you throw into it, the less relatable the function will be. Like we all know what y equals x squared looks like. In three dimensions, we could probably start to, you know, like by points, start to figure out what x, y squared looks like. You know, it would plot some points and get a sense of what that surface would look like. But if we're doing a function in three variables, so x, y, z, no idea what that's gonna look like. All right, so certain forms of technology are gonna become really useful. One form that I recommend is um, GeoGebra overkill in some other aspects. You know, if I just need a quick look at a graph or just need a tangent line or tangent plane as we'll learn, I don't need that AR app. But if I wanna get a feel for what these three dimensional surfaces look like, definitely worth, uh, definitely worth your time. Uh, the, this blurb here gives you all the characteristics of uh, functions of two variables. You've actually worked with functions of two variables before when you were dealing with implicit differentiation back in Calc 1, but you, you never really got into the, the why. Yeah, it was really just more so the how. So you got a derivative, you, you got numbers, and you just kind of moved on. Here, we're, we're gonna explore the graphs and what those graphs bring to the table, but then on top of that, we, we can kind of, or maybe not on top of that, but like embedded in that is the idea that we already have the skills necessary to do all this stuff. All right? Everything that we're going to learn in this unit, we already know how to do. It's just we got to kind of look at it a little bit differently. All right. So domain. All right. Well, the two things that we wanted to be mindful of back in Calc 1 when we talked about domain was what was gonna make the, the function undefined and that broke, broke itself up into two categories of imaginary or zero in the bottom of a fraction. But right off the bat here, I'm looking at a case that involves a natural log. Right? Natural logs have to be uh, greater than zero. It can't be zero or negative. So in this case, very simple, x has to, uh, sorry, negative x has to be greater than zero. I do enjoy the symmetry of my courses, because right now in Algebra 1, in my high school class, we're learning about inequalities. So the next step, they're still getting a handle on. But from your perspective, you've seen it for years. And that is, we're going to divide by a negative 1, but when you divide by a negative in an inequality, you change the direction of the sign. All right, so x has to be less than 0. All right, so to state my domain, I just got to make sure it's in the proper notation. There's really not much to it. It's just you're going to build around this statement of what x can be, bearing in mind that we would also have to take into account what y can be. Now, fortunately, there are no restrictions on y here. All right, y can be anything, and it's going to be perfectly OK, because y is not part of a log. It's not part of a radical. It's not part of a fraction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to surround this with an x comma y, a such that symbol, and a couple of squiggly brackets and move right on. All right. So what I'm indicating here is what the variables are that I'm working with and then the condition or set of conditions. So my variables are x and y such that x has to be less than 0. Anything else is implied. And that's perfectly OK. 
Probably not the worst idea in the world to state that this is the domain. So I'll say D with a colon, but that's not really necessary because that's the only thing we're being asked for here. All right, so we're stating what the variables of interest are and what the condition is or are. In single variable functions, yeah. But now we're working with functions of two variables, so the domain will be all possible values of x or y. But the most restrictive of both. Right. Now z is going to be our range, because z is in terms of x and y. So our domain is twofold now. So if I were working with a function of three variables, so w equals f of x times y times z, x, y, z would make up my domain. The W makes up my range, all right? Because W is dependent on whatever X, Y, and Z are, all right? So it's multiple layers to our our uh, independent variable. So range is pretty much just the all amount. Yeah. Now in number two, well, I got a radical. I don't want a negative under a radical, but that radical also happens to be in the bottom of a fraction. So uh, in addition to not having a negative, I don't want it to be equal to zero either. So I want 9 minus x squared minus y squared to be greater than zero. All right. Now this is where things start getting interesting because when you talk about domain and range, normally your domain is just a simple statement about what x can be and what x can't be, all right, or what x can't be. Here, what we're getting is a relationship between x and y, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? So I'm gonna subtract the nine from both sides. So negative x squared minus y squared greater than negative nine, and then I'm gonna negate everything. So x squared plus y squared less than nine. Because right, I'm dividing or multiplying both sides of an inequality by a negative, you change the direction of the sign. All right. So our restriction on this multivariable function happens to be a function itself. Well, not a function, but a, a relation between x and y. So I don't have to solve for y or solve for x. All I have to state is my domain for my variables x and y is restricted to any x squared and y squared values that add to give a result less than nine. All right, so x and y could be anything as long as when you square them and add them together, you get a result that's less than nine. That's the only thing we really care about. All right, so when I say it could be anything except, well, that's a, that's a pretty significant restriction, right? So it's not really a matter of, you know, like it can be anything. It's really, really limited in what it can be, but there, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Sometimes there's functions that are restricted to the point where it's like only one or two values. I mean, I remember you know, even in Algebra 1, where you'd say there's a function and its domain is just the numbers one and two. Like you just took the whole real number system and just reduced it down to just the numbers one and two, right? Here I'm saying it's fine, x and y can be anything as long as there's sum, the sum of the squares is equal to some number that's less than nine, all right? So it's gotta be within that interval. Now this graph, that's a different story. You start thinking about, okay, well, what would this graph look like? That's, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Number three, we want to look at any kind of transcendental function that might work its way into, well, the function. So cosine is not problematic because cosine is everywhere continuous and therefore differentiable and all that good stuff. So we're not worried about the domain there, but we do have to be mindful that some trig functions are undefined for certain values of x and in this case z. So if this were secant instead of cosine or tangent instead of cosine, we'd have to be careful about that. But as it turns out, the only values I'm worried about are x and y. So this puppy is good to go. As long as 
x is not equal to zero and y is not equal to zero. All right, so just a little reminder, this is the set notation symbol for and. Because right, if either of them are equal to zero, then this function is undefined and therefore all bets are off. Okay. Now we know when we were talking about domains back in Calc 1 that that kind of fed into the concept of a limit and then derivative. So this stuff is pretty important. Didn't I say x comma y comma z? x comma y comma Oh, there's a z there. Look at that. Thank you. Okay, so x comma y comma z such that x can't be equal to zero, or, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and y can't be equal to zero. So it feeds into understanding how to find a limit and what a limit is used for. It also feeds into a derivative. So we also know from Calc 1 that the limit definition of a derivative is what drives all the shortcuts behind differentiation. The good news is all that stuff is going to be true for multivariable as well. All right. And just to, at the risk of stealing my own thunder a little bit, basically all we're going to do whenever we're evaluating a limit or a derivative is we're going to treat the irrelevant variables as constant, right? And then take the derivative surrounding that variable, right? So that's what the lead-in is here. Cosine zero is one. Yeah, it can, but since it can't be zero, zero, it's uh, it's Oh, it's relative. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thanks. So limits and continuity, some of them, I mean, I, I suppose I could put a problem like this on a test, but I'm not gonna. Sometimes you can just plug in the values and get a real number, and that's the end of it. That's your limit. You know, just like it was in Calc 1. And, and you remember, like, it would be something like the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared. You plug it in and you got 4, and you're like, oh, this is great. And then it was almost immediately followed by something way more complicated, and you're like, okay, well, I, I, I know which one's going to be on the test, and it ain't going to be the one where I could just plug stuff in. All right? But we got to start somewhere, so here we are. All, right. All this stuff above, you could read through that. I find that, well, I don't want to call it a waste of time. But it kind of is if you already know your limit properties. Right? If, you, if you're a little iffy on your limit properties, then it is not even remotely a waste of time. So definitely uh, consider these things. It basically talks about the idea, and, and I'll tell you that these two are the ones that people tend to lose sight of. When I'm taking the limit of a product, I can take the limit of each factor of the product separately and then multiply the result later on. Same thing with the quotient. Right? That doesn't really work for any other aspect of algebra, but for limits it does. Right? And so that if you're gonna focus on anything, maybe it's that. But for the example, very straightforward. Just replacing all my x's with ones and my y's with I'm sorry, x's with twos and y's with ones. So, two times two squared times one plus three times two times one. Five times two times one squared plus three times one. Now, if it, were, if it were to make it undefined, then, or imaginary, then I'd have to do something else. 
but sometimes it just works. So what do we have? Eight plus six, so 14 up top. 13 on the bottom. Yeah. Hopefully, if not, then it's something else. But it's gonna be a real number, and that's the, that's the moral of the story there. Now, what does that mean? That's, that's a different conversation completely. All right, so I'm gonna go with a, a simpler example in a second, but what I, what I really just want to, I just want you to have in mind that when you're finding a limit as you're approaching a point, now bear in mind that X and Y is approaching two, one, and we're looking for a Z. All right, so this is the ordered triple that we're going to get as a result. But what we're getting as a, the result of the limit is the z value that the graph is approaching as you approach that coordinate, the, the x value of 2, the y value of 1, from every possible direction. All right? So not just from the left, not just from the right, but from every single possible direction that you could approach a point in three dimensions right, along the surface. Which is, I mean... It's not practical. Like, how can you do that? So we actually talk about disproving limits more than we talk about proving limits. Because how do you follow infinitely many pathways to a point? I mean, from the left and from the right, seeing if they agree, that was fine in top one. But from the left, from the right, from the front, from the back, from a 45 degree angle, 225 degree angle. Triangle. Yeah, like anything you could think of. You know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna play out right, all right? So we, we can't do that. So what we do is we look for a counterexample because if you cannot show that a limit does not exist, then there's reason to believe that the limit does exist, all right? So it's like the, the double negative thing. I'm, I'm gonna not show that it does not exist. Well, if that's the case, then it does exist. In this case, I, I have a set of examples where they do not exist, we just gotta figure out how and why. Because if you look at the diagram that I have here, which I would imagine is probably a lot better than it looks on your paper. Somewhat better than the way it looks on your paper. We're getting to the point of one zero. Now, best of luck to you if, you, if you're in, interested in trying to identify the location of one zero based off of that graph. But the idea is that coming in along this path, maybe this path, maybe that path, that path, coming down along the axes, every possible way you can think of, approaching x value of one, y value of zero, it's either gonna converge on a single location from every possible direction, or it's not. All right, all we have to do in order to show a limit does not exist is find one pathway that does not give the same limit as the other pathways. All right, so the first technique is what we just did. And it's the most commonly forgotten technique. All the way back to Calc 1. The idea of just plugging in a number, or in this case two numbers, people just forget to do it. So I'm going to plug in the y value of 0. And we get 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. All right, so in Calc 1, indeterminate meant that the limit existed. You just had to do some algebra to figure it out, All right? Here, it means something else. It generally means that the limit's not going to exist. You just got to do some algebra to figure it out, All right? So it's, it's the reverse, All right? So what do we do? Well, there's a couple of different, different possibilities. One thing that we could do is travel along a certain plane, all right? And the, the short way of saying this would be to hold, what we call it holding a variable constant, all right? So what I wanna do here is I wanna hold x, 
constant at 1. The short, the short, short way of saying that is just let x equal 1. And then see what the limit's going to be. Now, sometimes it gets the job done, sometimes it doesn't. All right? But we need a limit to exist somewhere from one pathway so that we can find a limit from another pathway in such a way that it does not equal the same value. That way we can show the limit does not exist. If we keep getting indeterminate, that's going to be a problem. All right? So I'm going to hold x constant at 1. I'm going to replace the x value with a 1. So limit as y approaches 0 of y over, now it's not x anymore because I'm assuming that the x value is equal to 1. Simplify. I get y over y. Now, y over y is an algebraic expression. y divided by y. I wouldn't apply the limit here. y divided by y is equal to 1. So once you hold a variable constant, you've now taken a multivariable limit and reduced it down to a single variable limit. So now your top one rules apply. Where if I were if I were to replace the zero, the, the y's with zero here, I would get zero over zero. In calc one, that meant there is a limit. You just gotta do some algebra to figure it out. All right. So I did my algebra. It was nice because all I had to do was divide. And I got a one, limit of a constant is equal to the constant. And so that tells me that along that one path, the the z value. Okay, the z value is really what we're focusing on here. So along the path, and I'll just write this out. We're not going to write it out every single time, but at least this first time, just so you get a conceptual understanding, it's, it's probably a good idea. Along the path where x is equal to 1, as y approaches 0, Z approaches one. All right, and we're going to look at this graphically in a couple minutes so that you can start to kind of make sense of it. Because what's going to happen is, well, what could happen is what happened to me. And now I, you got to understand, I didn't have the benefit of any of this technology back then. So there was a lot of hand waving, a lot of attempts at drawing stuff on the chalkboard. It did not work. All right, so what you could end up doing is what I did, and you just kind of reduce all this down to just steps that you're following, all right, without ever having any true understanding of why things are working the way they do. If you don't even consider the, consider the graph, then that's where you're gonna be. And some of us are fine with that. Now on a test, you have to follow a procedural approach because what are you gonna do? You're gonna conjure up augmented reality out of thin air? Like, I mean, it sounds great, you can tell me start it, but we're not there yet as a society, so I don't think that's gonna, that's gonna play. So you do have to, at some point, pare it down to just, these are the steps I need to follow, but prior to that, try to make the, uh, you know, the connections, all right? So if I, if I held x, at, x constant at one, why can't I do the same thing for y? Hold y constant, at zero. All right, so this would become the limit as x approaches one. Now I'm replacing all my y's with zeros. So zero over x plus zero minus one. All right, you can clean it up a little bit. 
But the bottom line is uh, you have a zero on the top of the fraction, that's going to become a zero. The limit of a constant is the constant itself. And so what this translates to is along the path, where y is equal to zero, as x approaches one, z approaches zero. Now ultimately you're approaching the same location just from two different pathways. But one pathway is bringing you to a z value of one, another pathway is bringing, to, bringing you to a z value of zero. Now, it doesn't have to be left and right, but you can kind of analogize it to that. Analogize? Analogize? Um, whatever. So left and right, if you were aiming for two different locations, that was a jump discontinuity. All right? Here, it may be like kind of a skew relationship where you're coming in from maybe the left and then maybe you're coming in at a 310 degree angle. But the bottom line is you're aiming for two different z values. There's a dis disconnection there. There's a discontinuity. All right, so what that tells me is that the limit does not exist. So therefore, the limit does not exist. And you could just write D and E, or you could write the words out, but that's really the ultimate relationship. You just need to show that along different paths, you're gonna get a different result, all right? So let me, uh, let me see if I can AR this. So, second problem, seems like it's basically a repeat of the first one, but there's a little extra oomph to, <clears throat> to it because you get through the first two strategies that I showed you, and then you realize that it's not taking you in the right direction. You're like, oh, well, what do I do now? But you gotta start somewhere. So what we do, again, is we hold one of the variables constant. Now, something to keep in mind, you can hold the variable to be constant at whatever you want. I mean, I can let x equal 20 if I want. It just wouldn't serve any purpose. But I can, I mean, x is a variable. If I want it to be constant, all I have to do is make it not vary. Right? But the, the most logical thing to let it be equal to would be 0, because that's what we're approaching. So hold x constant. at zero. And again, you, you, you do enough of these examples, you stop wanting to write hold x constant at zero repeatedly, so it becomes let x equal zero. But you gotta understand though, what we're doing is we're creating a pathway, a plane, that will intersect the surface, which will create a pathway that you can travel along. It's a cross section, all right? It's kinda like if there's a hill or a mountain or a mountainous region and you were to create a cross section of it, you'd be slicing a plane right through that, vertically, right through that, that region. What it traces out along the circumference, you know, the, the edges of the hill, the, the highest points, lowest points and peaks and valleys and all that, that is the pathway that we're looking at, right? And we, all we wanna know is where this is going as we follow that pathway, all right? Is it going to Mordor or is it going somewhere else, all right? So I'm gonna, write the limit as y approaches zero because all of my axes are getting replaced with zeros. So zero times y over zero squared plus y squared. Now that just boils down to just zero. Zero over anything is gonna be zero as long as that anything isn't zero itself. All right, because this is really the same. I'll show the intermediate step now that I think about it. Limit as y approaches zero of zero over y squared. And that zero over y squared simplifies down to just zero. And the limit of a constant is a constant. All right, so we have a value to compare with, right? There are no wasted steps in this. So we held x constant at zero. And you're like, I got x equals zero. I need to show that the limit does not exist. You're not gonna get just a D and E, right? You, you gotta get a limit from one pathway in order to show that a limit from another pathway is gonna give you something else, all right? So now I'm gonna hold Y constant
at zero. And that's gonna give me the limit as x approaches zero, because x still varies. y is the thing that's constant. So y times zero over x squared plus zero squared. All right, so just like the previous one, that's gonna be the limit as x approaches zero. of zero over x squared, which is the limit as x approaches zero of zero, which is zero. All right, now again, no wasted steps, but you look at this and say, well, that sure seems like a wasted step. We're trying to show that the limit does not exist. This seems like we're showing that the limit does exist. All right, but what we're getting from this is from two different pathways, the y value is approaching zero, all right? Now, the, the, the graph, I mean, what, what are you getting from the graph? It's, it's, so, it's so iffy. I can't tell if this is a smooth curve that's coming down. It seems like it is over here. Or is this, is this going to be kind of like a cusp, right, where it, it comes up and then it has a steep drop off. It pitches back in where you have no points that exist in that empty space. I, I, I can't tell. Right? So I need something else. Right? So, this is where things get interesting. I can let X or Y be anything I want, right? I could even let X and Y be some kind of relationship with one another. If we go back to the first page, I think it was, um, yeah, it was number two on page 51. The one that said nine minus X squared minus Y squared. What we got for that domain was that X and Y could be anything as long as the relationship was that x squared plus y squared was less than nine. All right? That's going to come back into play repeatedly over and over again throughout this unit. And that is, yeah, okay, well maybe y and x aren't constant values. Maybe there's some relationship between x and y. All right? Maybe the pathway that I'm taking is not a plane. Maybe it's a parabola. It's parabolic. All right? So imagine a parabola with height. It'd be some, some sort of bowed figure. So you'd be looking at something that looks like this. All right? This is a parabola with some height. All right? It could be like that. All right? Maybe it's a cubic function. All right? This is what a cubic function in three spaces would look like. All right? It's just basically a cubic graph just with, with some depth to it. All right? I don't think I can do a trig. Oh, I could do a trig function. Here's a, here's a sine function. All right? You get like any number of possibilities come into play. All we're looking for is some kind of relationship between X and Y. I, I just need a pathway that's gonna get me to that location, but then also give me a limit that's something other than zero. All right, so we'll start off with uh, a linear relationship. Maybe it's along the path where X is equal to Y. I'll write Y equals X. All right, so it's another plane. I need that plane to go through the x, y value of zero, zero. All right, so thinking back to just two-dimensional space, that would be the origin. All right, forget about z for a second. I need some relationship that allows x and y to both, or like the, the x and y values to both be equal to zero. y equals x, x equals y works, all right? So what I do at this point is I replace one of the variables with the other. All right. What a lot of people will do is create what we call a dummy variable to replace both of them. Because if x and y are the same, then I could just say, well, let's let t be equal to x and y. All right. So that's what I'm going to do because it, it keeps things a little cleaner. So let my dummy variable t equal x and y. And so I'd redefine my limit in terms of t. So instead of x comma y approaches 0, 0, since t is taking the place of x and y, t would approach 0. And so I'd be looking at t times t over t squared plus t squared. So I'd end up with t squared 
over 2t squared. And like I said, this is, this is a personal preference. I mean, a lot of other people have the same personal preference, so I guess it's really not too personal. But you could just, I mean, if x and y are the same, you could use direct substitution and just replace all your x's with y's, or replace all your y's with x's, right? So you'd have the same expression, perhaps, but just with x squared over 2x squared as x approaches 0, or the same thing, but with y's. It's all, it's all amounting to the same thing. But the great news is the t squares will cancel away. And the limit of a constant is equal to a constant. And that constant 1 half is not the same as the other constants of 0. So therefore, the limit does not exist. So the big question I usually get at this point, not that I want to preempt any of the questions that you might have, but how do I know y equals x? Well, I started simple. I started with x being equal to a constant, y being equal to a constant. I could have tried a different constant. I don't know how that would have played out. But then I start escalating my function, right? So constant functions are power of zero. The next one up would be linear. Then after, if this didn't work, I would try a quadratic. Maybe I'd let y equal x squared. If that didn't work, y equal x cubed. x to the fourth, x to the fifth. If the polynomials weren't working, maybe I'd try a trig function, all right? Just a note on that, I would never try a trig function unless I looked at the graph. And for these kind of questions, I, I give the graph because I want you to be able to evaluate what's going on. Uh, even though you're not going to be able to look at the graph and say, oh, clearly the limit does not exist, you should be able to look at it and say, ah, a trig function's appropriate or a trig function's not appropriate, right? This one looks like maybe there's a little oscillation going on there. Maybe a trig function would be appropriate. So maybe instead of going along the path y equals x, maybe I go along the path of y equals the sine of x. All right, so that, that's another pathway that's open to you. All right, so what I'm going to do, well, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a star on that one because I'm exercising my teacherly right of this. All right, from Calc 1. Um, maybe, maybe from Calc 1. Um, this is one of the most popular topics that are skipped in Calc 1 when people run out of time. Yeah. Depends on what time of year you take Calc 1. If you take it during the summer, it's definitely skipped. <laughs> if you take it during the spring, it may or may not be skipped depending on whether or not there's a lot of snow. And it's, uh, but usually, it's one of the first topics to go. Right? But it's not, it's not bad. I mean, don't get me wrong, that makes it look like it's bad. This is very frightening. But really what we're trying to do is find the limit of two functions that we know surround the, fun the given function, right? x squared y over x squared plus y squared. All right, so I want to designate two functions that I know surround that function. All right, find the limit of those two outer functions. If I find that limit and it turns out that they're equal or those limits and it turns out that they're equal to one another, then the inner function, the one that's trapped in between those two outer functions, would have to take on that same limit. Alright. So I'll you know what? Let me let me just go back and calc one it real quick. So I'll give you a quick calc one example. Because honestly, I mean, you're, you're just going to be memorizing steps. If, you, if, you, if you've never seen this in Calc 1, that's, that's all you're going to end up doing if I don't show you this. So let's say you have a limit as x approaches, now i got to remember the example. Do I want infinity? I'll go with infinity. Keep it simple. Something that we know we could find the limit of, you know, whether you know it off the top of your head or you just know how you would find it in the calculator, this is something that you could easily find the limit of. All right? 
So what I want to do is determine a function that I know, or a pair of functions that I know surround this function. All right. So 1 over x plus 1, I know that that is going to be in between two other functions. It's just a question of what those two functions are. All right. Now we can look at this numerically, but we could also, I don't know, we could look at it graphically. We could look at it just logically. Uh, let, let's just take a case, uh, a numerical case. Let's say I have the number one half. All right. The number one half and the number one third. I'll write the number one third here. What's the relationship between these two values? Greater than, less than, or equal. What do I put in between? Well, I don't put an equal. Is one third bigger than or smaller than one half? Smaller. smaller. All right. So this is smaller than that. All right. So if the denominator of a fraction is larger, then that fraction's value is going to be smaller than the other fraction. All right. So what I would want to do is come up with a fraction that I know definitely is going to be larger than this. In order to do that, I just need to come up with a fraction that I know has a denominator that's smaller. All right. So 1 over x will get the job done. Generally, something simpler. That's kind of the point. All right. So let's take a look at the graph real quick. All right. So yeah, let's just take a look. Not too dissimilar to something I was working on before, apparently. Uh, so 1 over x plus 1. So I'll just do a little alpha fraction, 1 over x plus 1. And then 1 over x. Taking a quick look at the picture of my terrible scale, so I'm just going to bring it in a lot. All right. Now, this is going out to infinity, so I only care about positive values. Let me just uh, bring it back. The graph, let's see. The, it's hard to see on that, but the 1 over x is the red one. All right, so 1 over x is the red one. Can I make that a little bolder? Yeah, definitely. Ooh, that's too bold. Good enough. So this is my 1 over, of course, I got my color scheme backwards. But this is the y equals 1 over x. And this is y equals 1 over x plus 1. All right. So it's pretty clear that this is a function that's all, or maybe it's not clear, clear, but it seems as though that this function is always going to be physically larger than this one in terms of y. All right, so now I just need something that's going to surround it on the low side. Now, all I have to do is reflect y equals 1 over x over the x-axis. And I'll, I'll get something that's going to naturally bound it on the low side. So it's going to look something like this. All right, so it'll naturally bound it on the low side. Both are going to have the same horizontal asymptote. So they're going to converge for extreme values of x. And this function, y equals 1 over x plus 1, is always going to be trapped in between. All right, so if I could figure out the limit as x approaches infinity of these two outer functions, then I'll have the limit that I'm looking for. So what I do, and it's just a, a simple notation trick here, is I apply the limit to each 
element of the inequality. All right. So on the low end, I'm just looking for the limit as x approaches infinity of negative 1 over infinity. That's going to be equal to 0. And on the high end, same deal. Now, you may be wondering about my magical transition from less than symbols to less than or equal to symbols. That, that's less magic than it is theoretical. The idea is that the limit is talking about getting out to infinity. If I were ever able to actually get out to infinity, all three of these curves would have merged into the same curve. Right? So they would have equality. But it isn't until I apply the limit that less than becomes less than or equal to. But this is a proof, this is a squeeze theorem proof for the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x plus 1 being equal to 0. That's calc 1. All right? Whether you saw it or not is a different story, but you know, should have seen it. Or maybe not. I go back and forth on that. I don't know, like, because what's the point of seeing it in calc 1 if the next time you're going to see it is now? I don't know. Either way. But anyway, we have to apply that now. But fortunately, we're using the same thing. Exactly. Another name for it is the sandwich theorem, but that just sounds absurd. Squeeze theorem is borderline what we're willing to accept in terms of like non-mathematical terms to justify something. But calling it a sandwich theorem, I'll call it a hoagie theorem or something like this is a, like if we're gonna go nuts, we might as well go nuts. <laughs> so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start off with a relationship that we know to be true, all right? Like for example, I know, and I'm, I'm just gonna start with the denominator because that numerator is a little funky. I'm just gonna start off with that denominator, one over x squared plus y squared. I know that that's gonna be less than one over x squared. Or one over y squared, just not both. Right? My, my rationale on that is the denominator is smaller for the larger fraction. Right? So it's a true statement. Now, we may end up spinning our wheels here. We go through the whole process and find out that I chose poorly and go back and choose 1 over y squared instead. But the bottom line is my second fraction needs to be larger than my first fraction. In order for that to happen, its denominator has to be smaller than the first fraction's denominator. All right. So if I reflect this, I get negative 1 over x squared. Now, my middle function is not 1 over x squared plus y squared. It's x squared y over x squared plus y squared. So what I can do is multiply the whole shibiggity bang here by x squared y. And when I do that, I'm going to get negative y is less than x squared y over x squared plus y squared, which is less than, in turn, in turn less than y itself. So in the, in the previous, or the example that I created, and by the way, if anybody's looking for typo bonus, that example, that, that could be an example that I use for future classes. I might as well just throw it in there. It seems like a reasonable use of our time. So uh, the typo could be on page, whatever this is, include calc one squeeze theorem example. All right, and I'll know what that means. Um, I don't generally like to get in the habit of looking at everybody's grades throughout a class session, but for typos, I don't think there's too many people. Yeah, there's only two two instances where somebody has submitted a typo throughout the whole course. Okay. Right. Was that? Uh, not that I know of. I think somebody might have beat you out. For one. Early on. Yeah. So the, all you have to do is on remind, just page number what the error is and what the fix is. Do that for three separate instances and you get three bonus points. 
right? It's pretty easy because as you've seen, I make typos all the time. Right? And spacing is the number one thing. Like if I could fix one thing about my notes moving forward, it would be spacing, all right? So like for those, those instances where like I gave you a quarter of an inch of space to do like a mile and a half worth of work, like tell me about those instances because that, that's gonna make my life easier. Because again, we know this. I'll never run out of space, right? So, but you repeatedly run out of space. So anyway, I'm gonna apply the limit. As x, y approaches zero, zero. As we go forward, you're gonna find that that's probably the most annoying part of this, having to write that repeatedly which is why I use the squiggly bracket notation instead of writing it for each part. Right? And you'll see here that the, for the outer functions, the x part is irrelevant, right? Because it's kind of like we're holding y, oh, I'm sorry, holding x constant. It just kind of worked out that way. So I'm replacing y with zero on the, on the low and upper bounds. I'm getting zero. And so I'm looking at the limit as x, y approaches zero, zero of that given function is in between zero and zero. So it's a pretty safe bet that it's gonna itself be equal to zero by the squeeze theorem, all right? And by safe bet, I mean it's guaranteed. I wanna be absolutely clear about that. There will definitely be a squeeze theorem problem on the next unit test. Uh, the good news about it is there's only so many of them that work. So what you see is what you get. Like what's going to be on the test related to the squeeze theorem is going to look an awful lot like one of these. All right. Maybe it won't be x squared y over x squared plus y squared, maybe it's x cubed y over x cubed plus y cubed, but it's gonna be structured almost identically to one of these problems. All right, so an opportunity for you. Now, number five looks really, really complicated in comparison, but I'll tell you right now, it's no more difficult than number four. All right, it just has a lot of extra oomph to it. It looks a little crazier, but it's not at all any more difficult. All right. The one thing you do have to be mindful of, these are approaching, x, y is approaching zero, zero. Now it's approaching one, zero, right? So people who mess this up, they mess it up because they get in the habit of putting zeros in for both x and y, all right? You gotta actually see what the limit is approaching. All right. Huh. No, okay. I was wondering why I put this here, but this is actually the appropriate placement for it. So we're looking for continuity. In order to address continuity, we have to determine the domain. All right. So looking at this function, I want to identify any instance where the denominator would be equal to zero. That would happen if x squared minus y is equal to zero. All right, so my domain is gonna be related to this equation, which can be simplified a little bit, really just by adding the y to both sides, y equals x squared. All right, so my domain specifically in the appropriate notation going to be that x and y are my variables and my restriction is that y has to be the squared values of x. Whatever x is, square it, that's going to be equal to y, that's going to be the restriction to this function. So what I did was I actually graphed on GeoGebra the original function and then the restriction. Right? So in order for this graph to exist, 
every x and y value has to follow this, this, this pathway. All right, so for continuity, because you know, continuity and differentiability are still gonna be a thing. So it's the question of, well, where does the function exist? Where does it not exist? So when it comes to making a determination of when, when a function does not exist, this relationship comes into play. All right, it goes back to what we talked about with vector values, vector valued functions. The function has to exist at certain points and then the limit from all directions need to exist. All right, so what that's telling me is that I need to show or at least have a reason to think that the limit, now we don't have enough information to continue with this one, but at least we could talk about the setup. We need to state that the limit as x, y approaches a, b of x squared minus y is going to be equal to the, really the same function just with a's and b's in it. All right, so it's really just direct substitution, which is not, it's not difficult. So we would just say a over a squared minus b. All right. But again, as long as we know that where b is equal to a squared, as long as we know that b is equal to a squared, we're going to be in good shape. All right. So one thing that you could do is actually replace certain values. So for example, you know, this is more, more kind of an analytic approach. You're not, it's more of a proof than anything else. You're not really establishing anything in the realm of, um, I don't even know what the right word is, like um, finite math, but you can at least progress a little bit. So isn't that just A over zero? A over zero. Oh, shouldn't it be why can't be? Yeah, it's one of those days. So then, yeah, because what I was about to do was, oh, actually, yeah, okay, so there, there actually is something you can do because what we can, we can show or prove the limit does not exist when y equals x squared. I mean, there's really not much you can do with that, I don't think, but, you know, it's something. You know, without any numbers in the problem, there's really not much. But if I were to say, instead of the limit as x, y approaches a, b, I could say the limit as x comma x squared approaches a, b. And then replace all my y's with x squares. I would get the limit as x comma x squared approaches a b. This looks terrible. See, like I said before, you, you find as you go forward that the most aggravating part about any of this is writing what the limit is approaching, especially if it's in uh, three variables. So you end up with x over zero, which is undefined. And so we would say the limit does not exist. But that's really all you could do. I mean, it's significant though, but I don't think it advances the plot too much because we, we already knew that. Like this is just saying what we knew by setting this equal to zero. So it, it's really more of a valuable situation when, when you're given particular numbers. But. It was something. So when? All right, so the last thing we were talking about tonight are partial derivatives. And I'm going to let you off the hook. Well, I'll be honest. I'm going to let myself off the hook and not get into the limit definition of a partial derivative. Because really, 
it's the same as the limit definition of a derivative. You're just gonna have y's in there when you're taking the derivative with respect to x, and the other way around when you're taking the derivative with respect to y. It's really just kind of aggravating, um, especially since it's something that you would already, already have a pretty decent sense of. Now we will get into the uh, graphical representation of this stuff because there is a lot of meaning to it because we're taking a partial derivative. So what is that, like a quarter of a derivative? What are we talking about here? Is it like a little little piece of a derivative? What, what's going on? You know, so we do have to get into like why on earth would this be a useful thing to, to learn about? But for now, you know, with the last few minutes that we have, we're just gonna get into the act of taking derivatives. And also uh, what are known as second order partials. All right, the notation, it looks pretty similar to um, the ordinary notation for derivatives. It's just the uh, lowercase delta symbol is actually what we use for partial derivatives. Okay. Now, it's kind of interesting to think about this, but uh, I don't know if you ever got the origin story behind the notation in Calc 1. When you learned about dy dx, and, and I'll just actually do that real quick. Because I think it's valuable to, for people to know this. Because some of the notation seems like it comes out of thin air, but it really doesn't. So you have slope, the uh, general slope formula, delta y over delta x. Right? That's capital delta. And I'll highlight it. Huh? Got to move slightly and then highlight it for some reason. All right. Now, that slope is specifically over an interval. All right. So slope over, over an interval. I always sell calculus as being an entire set of course. Well, it depends on the course. But Calc 1, I say it's an entire course dedicated to the study of slope. And I don't think I'm lying. I think that's actually what it is. Right? It's just what are you doing with those slopes? Then you have slope at a point. All right. And so for that, we use delta y over delta x. All right. Also delta, but this time it's a lowercase delta. All right. So what happened is in Calc 1, they kind of streamlined that down to just D, with the, with the reason being, uh, I'm not going to write that symbol over and over again. That seems like a waste of effort. So we'll just use D. The reality is, even in Calc 1, you are working with partial derivatives, because every first um, single variable, I almost said first order function, uh, single variable function can also be thought of as a multivariable function, but with the one of the variables being held constant. All right? So when you're taking the derivative of y in terms of x, you are taking the partial derivative of the function y in terms of x. It's just you're holding y constant. Does that mean we can just use d here? Well, that's the thing. Moving forward, we're going to use lowercase d for something else. Oh. So. You know, basically what I'm getting at here is that in Calc all the way through now, we have been using dy dx incorrectly because it means something completely different. So it should have been this symbol the whole time? It should have been this symbol the whole time. Oh. So, but, you know, like let's say you never get to this course. What do you know? What do you care, you know? So, but it isn't, it isn't until this moment where it becomes relevant. All right, so when I say delta f delta x, I'm saying the partial derivative of f with respect to x, all right? Because what I could be doing is taking the partial derivative of f with respect to the other variable in the function y. I could also be taking the partial derivative of f with respect to some constant. You know, that's the thing. Like, what you're taking the derivative with respect to, it, it could be anything sometimes not even relevant to the function. Like for example, I have a function here in terms of x and y, I could take the derivative of this with respect to t. And we've done that before. That's parametrics, right? We could parameterize it in terms of a new variable, right? So 
there's no limit to in what way you can differentiate. Because really, if you go back to the idea that slope is a rate of change, you could, you could create a new rate of change. I mean, I could take the rate of change of your grade over time, right? I just take like what the change is over the number of days, right? So does it make sense? I don't know, right? Uh, maybe you want to divide it by the number of tests. Like if I want, like let's say you have three tests all equally weighted. You could average them together, all right? That average is a rate, right? You're taking the rate of change of your test scores per unit of tests, all right? That's what a mean is, that's what an average is. But then I could take the, that rate and relate it to time and create what we call in Calc 1 related rates, all right? So I could differentiate with respect to whatever I want. So this notation is the all-encompassing notation that we use for any kind of derivative, no matter what the variable is, right? And we'll talk about next class what, they, what the lowercase d actually means, right? But all this is telling us to do is treat y as constant and differentiate with respect to x, right? So we're going to treat y as constant. All right, there's multiple forms of partial derivatives. The, the two most popular are this one and also the lowercase f with a little subscript of x. That, that means the same thing. People like this one, I think for obvious reasons. It's less writing, all right? So just f with a little subscript of x. And then when you get into second order partials, which I should have, could I, yeah. So here's a second order partial, first as a mixed second order partial. First derivative with respect to x, second derivative with respect to y. You could write it like that, but if you use this notation, it's much simpler. All right, so that, we'll get to that in a minute. So, yeah, partial with respect to x. We do it a piece at a time. I'll color code. One thing I think that you'll probably like about this is that it takes functions that look like it's probably supposed to be product rule or quotient rule and makes it much simpler. All right, so 3x squared, my variable is x. So that's just, I take the derivative of that the way I normally would. So 6x. 4y squared. Is that an f or a y? Is that an f? Delta. Oh, delta f. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be an f. Poor quality f. Because what's happening is when I take a derivative, or actually if I just have a function defined in terms of x and y, it's implied that that function represents z. You know, f of x was the same as y. f of x comma y is the same as z, All right? So this is really, I mean, if you were to use prime notation, you would think of this the way you would, like y prime, this would be like z prime, All right? But z prime of what? Like, are we talking in terms of x or in terms of y? So we have to be more particular about our, our notation here. All right. Now, 4y squared. If we're treating y as constant, then 4y squared itself is constant. Derivative of a constant is equal to 0. That just got a whole lot nicer. This next piece, you don't have to do this step of rewriting it, but at least this one time, maybe you should. I'm going to rewrite it as negative 2y times x squared. All right, because y is constant, that makes the negative 2y into a constant multiple. Or a scalar multiple. So when we take the derivative using the power rule, we take the power, multiply it by the coefficient, reduce the power by 1. 
that y, I mean negative 2y, that might as well be negative 27. Or negative 200 if y was equal to 10. Whatever, it doesn't matter. You're treating it like you would if it were a coefficient. So 2 times negative 2y is going to be negative 4y. Reduce the power of x by 1. So times x to the first power. Do the same thing for the next piece. 7xy squared. We could think of that as 7y squared times x. That x has an understood power to the, uh, of 1. Power multiplied by coefficient. Because again, that's 7y squared. No matter how complicated it is, it only consists of coefficients multiplied by y's, which we're treating as constant. So no matter how complicated it is, it's still going to be treated as a constant. All right, so 1 times 7y squared is 7y squared times x to the 0th power, which would go to 1 anyway. And that last little negative 9 there, irrelevant, because the derivative of a standalone constant is going to be 0 anyway. So we're looking at 6x minus 4xy plus 7y squared. Right. Now, in Calc 1, the way you'd have, you would have handled that, you would have had to use implicit differentiation and product rule. That would have been crazy. Mechanically, this is not bad. All right? It's just not something that you're overly eager to do. But, it could, I mean, it could be a lot worse. Oh, speaking of worse. <clears throat> <clears throat> Compute all four second order partial derivatives. All right. So what I'm going to do is snag my previous answer. So partial with respect to x was 6x minus, uh, what was it, 4 was it 4xy plus uh, 7y squared? All right. It's when you get into second order partials where you're like, ah, uh, yeah, let's talk about that other notation right quick. So we could look at this as just an f sub x. Because if I want the second order partial, fxx, fxy. We need them both. All right, because all four would be partial with respect to x, then y, x, then x, y, then x, and y, then y. All right, so we have all those permutations that we have to account for. All right, and you can do it in, in, in any order you want. I tend to want to do the mixed because they're actually, I'm going to steal my own thunder a little bit. There is a relationship between mixed higher order partial derivatives. So if your function is continuous, then your mixed partials will be equivalent. Okay? So your f of x, y would be the same as f of x, uh, f of y, x. Right? So, but that's only if it's continuous, which is why we were talking about continuity. Okay? So you just have to keep in mind what it is you're looking for here. So I'm, I'm working off of my first order partial with respect to x. Now I'm going to take its derivative with respect to y. All right, so my variable here is y. So I'm going to highlight the relevant variable. Everything else is treated as constant. So the derivative of 6x goes to 0, irrelevant. The derivative of this, that y, has an understood exponent of 1. That is, again, a highlighter and not a marker. Power multiplied by coefficient. My coefficient now is negative 4x. So 1 times negative 4x is negative 4x. y to the 0th power. OK, well, y to the 0th is 1, so ignore it. This, I'm taking the derivative. Again, my relevant variable is y. 
So I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to y. So I'm going back to calc 1 and taking this derivative. All right, so 14y. All right, going back to my first order partial, I take the derivative now with respect to x. So 6x goes to 6. That's easy enough. All right, my relevant variables are the x's. That 7y squared is going away because there are no x's in there. So 7y squared is constant. So now it's really just a matter of accounting for this middle one, which could be thought of. All right, so I'll just circle it, pull it off on the side. That's the same as saying negative 4y times x to the first. All right, so power multiplied by coefficient minus 4y x to the 0 power, drop it because x to the 0 power is equal to 1. All right, so now we're going to do all that again, but this time we're starting off with a first order partial with respect to y. Skill-wise, it's going to be exactly the same, though. Uh, hmm. Yeah, that's what we're going to do in a minute, yeah. All right, so now what we're looking at is going back to the original function and differentiating that with respect to y. So my relevant variable is y. Every instance of x is going to be considered constant. So 3y squared, done. I'm sorry, 3x squared. All right, that's constant, derivative of a constant is equal to zero. Four y squared, take the derivative of that calc one style, eight y. This could be thought of as negative two x squared y to the first power. Power by coefficient, reduce the power by one, negative two x squared. Same idea for the next one, except the power is two, so plus 14 x y. So now I want to do, I personally, again, like to do my mixed second order partials. All right, because these functions are continuous. I know they're continuous because I don't have any radicals. I don't have any denominators with variables in it. I don't have natural logs. I don't have trig functions. I don't have anything that would cause any funky values here. So I expect this mixed second order partial would be the same as that one. All right. So I'm differentiating with respect to x, which means that the 8y is constant, goes away. This one becomes negative 4x. And if I think of this as 14yx, that would differentiate down to 14y. All right, so it verifies what I was saying. I mean, maybe not the continuity part of it, but at least that the second order partials would be the same. So, you know, you kind of look at a situation where maybe you have um, a fourth order partial that has two x's and two y's in it. It doesn't matter what the arrangement is, all right? So let's say, yeah, let's say it's a fourth order partial. So the fourth derivative, and in one case it says you're supposed to do f sub x, y, x, y. And in another case it says f sub y, y, x, x, all right? They're both mixed fourth order partials because the functions, uh, you know, I'm establishing that the original functions are continuous. Those two mixed or, uh, fourth order partials should be equivalent to one another, which means pick the easiest pathway to get you to that, that arrangement of partials and you're good to go, all right? For here, we go back to f sub y. So eight y becomes eight. We don't expect this to be the same as f sub x, x, so you know, all bets are off here. But nicely, the negative 2x squared is going to go away, and we'll be just looking at 14x. And right, so plus 14x. All right. So numbers 3 and 4 are basically a rehash of 1 and 2, except there's a, some trig and exponentials in there, so again my teacherly right.
compute all four second orders. Where and we got six of it. One, two, three, four. These are first order partials. But we needed to get the first order partials in order to get the second order partials. So, yeah. so there's a lot, a lot of writing, and and these these will take you a few minutes, but it's definitely worth your time because there there is a little bit of quirkiness when it comes to transcendental functions, the exponentials and traits, that that is worth spending some time on it. All right. So that'll do it. If you have any questions, stick around. Otherwise. Have a wonderful evening, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Yeah, I did see my average. Right. Um, I was surprised. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, you're yeah. in the game, you know? That's the whole thing. So, yeah, I just got to hit the two, two minutes out. Right. And let's see, like, you could do some typos. That'll get you up a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I, I've always been doing those. Yeah, you've been doing a tech stuff. assignment. So yeah, it's gonna just cut it like if we get that average up yeah. a little bit. Okay. Yeah, you're gonna like exactly. it's so still doable. Nice. Yeah. So we have another test in the final, right? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Do I have hope? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. Because what what are we at here? Like we're gonna <laughs> be bad on the bar. I was thinking of dropping this because not that I need it, but I just want to be. No, yeah, your, the yours are the, it's the tech assignments. Yeah. If you get, oh, let, let me just, let me just put I it in. Time. I'm, I won't be just sitting back and I drive back. Yeah. Right, it's like, but. And then I come here, it's like I'm trained. You know? I'm no, I understand. Other other yeah, one. but let me just put it in perspective for you. If you get those in, you have like a B. Oh, good. Yeah, so I mean, it's very doable. <laughs> like, you know. I wanted to get it higher, but it's like. Right, but I that's, some, that's a topic. place to start, you know? I understand the topic, but it's memory that's like... Yeah. It's hard for me to, unless I write down every sheet of paper, then I, want, I can't. Right. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. I thought, um, weren't we supposed to have a quiz today? Yeah, we were, but I forgot to make photocopies, so that ended up not happening. So I'm going to reschedule that for next week. Okay, cool. So, but I'll talk about it on Wednesday, and then I'll, I'll we'll do it next week. Yeah, right. Okay, that's right. I just was wondering about that. And yeah. For the last quiz, for the bonus. Um, but it was a smart move not to bring it up like an hour ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just wanted to get that shift there. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, for the last quiz, for the bonus, um, is it still possible if I may hand that in? Uh, the last, oh, the, the unit circle one? Yeah. Let me get, get your time under what? Oh, I said that's you. 2.30. 2.30. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, yeah, totally. Oh. What would yeah, that just, show, though? What's that? What would that extra credit show? It would be on Blackboard. It's under bonus unit circle, uh, unit circle game. All right. Yeah, it's all up there. Did you count this? And yeah, you got, you got credit for that. Me? All yeah. Because right. I remember sending it to you. Yeah, you definitely got credit for that. Did you count this as an error? Did you back the test or? Oh yeah, yours is like right there somewhere. Oh. There it is. I know we just like yeah, I didn't, really I didn't so that between the arc and the parentheses right there could there be a space. Right yeah, there? yeah. I'll, I'll take anything that makes my notes better. Yeah, like I, I'm not, uh, I'm not picky. Like if it, even if it's something like aesthetic, you know, like if it'll make it look nicer, if it, a suggestion, you know, I'll, I'll take anything. Okay. okay. Thank you. No problem. I didn't do so hot on this one. Yeah, so, yeah. but your average is not, it's not terrible, so, I mean, I mean, to, yeah. even with that, to still be, like, living in the, the B territory is not, like, that. Yeah, so. but this one, if this is my lowest grade, this is... And it would, it would drop, just watch attendance, because you can come in and leave. Actually, no, I don't really come in late, I usually come in on time. I usually come in, like, five minutes half late. Half an hour All right, that's, that's, <laughs> just for, that's just for today. I usually, I usually come in on time. I got you three consecutive classes late. Can I see? How late was I? Because I remember you saying that I could come at least like five minutes late or two minutes and I don't come that late. I know that for a fact. I don't do that. Yeah, the problem is I wait before I take attendance, so... If That's why I was shocked when I saw my, my participation as five out of ten. Yeah, so just like, <coughs> just like, get cause that... Because I, I, know, I know I come in on time. Like, I come in within two minutes, within like... Usually I come on, on exactly on time. But like I, I was so shocked when I saw that too because I know I come in on time like I don't come in that late I know you gave me like there's like a ten minute span or a five minute span right. and I always come in within that that's, yeah difference. that's not the uh, that's not the final grade for participation so like if you could just 
maybe a minute earlier. Two minutes. I mean, today is a different story, but yeah, today was the, I had to do. But like, like yeah, yeah, just just a smidge earlier. Yeah. That that I th that'll be fine because that that could easily. I mean, it it goes. I revised that grade at the end of the semester. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it's not like that grade is the grade, and yeah. then I put a new one in. I changed that grade at the end of the semester. Okay. So you could expect, I mean, as long as you're, you get the attendance squared away, then you, you could expect that to go up. That, that it could even become a perfect score. Okay. And I, I can still apply for my lowest test grade to be dropped, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's that's, a, that's why I always tell people to be mindful of attendance, because if you go over that threshold, then you lose the ability to drop your lowest test grade. And that's more than participation score. That's that's the big deal. Yeah, yeah. That's, I don't want to lose that at all. Yeah. I, I, this test was like, I don't know. I Wait, how, you, how the dropping your test grade work? If you, if you meet the attendance requirement, which is, uh, i got to look it up because it changes from class to class, but usually it's two. Two days absent. Yeah. So two absences, two, or two unexcused absences. Uh, as long as you don't go over that, then you can drop your lowest test grade. Oh, thank you, Professor. You're welcome, but take it easy. So you're you're in good shape. So if, yeah. Yeah. as long as you don't hit a stretch of absenteeism, you'll be fine. You know, so then that, that <laughs> test can go away. And then yeah, it, the only thing is the the trade-off is that you'd be on a hook for the final exam. But you know, like for a lot of folks, they hope to be able to take the the three tests have a, an average that they're happy with and not have to sit for the final. But, you know, like having the bailout of not having, you know, to have a bad grade count, that's an important thing too, you know. I want to know that um, to get the limit did not exist for this one, and this one has should not equal exceed. Correct, I, either of them. Once you get one different limit, then you, you show that the limit doesn't exist, exist. exactly. Oh, okay.